Hello and welcome to The Culture Bar. I'm Henry Southern and today we will be having what will no doubt be an insightful and interesting discussion with Mark Pemberton, OBE, Chief Executive of the Association of British Orchestras since 2007. Welcome, Mark. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for joining us. I mean, you've had quite a year already. I mean, uh, you've received an OBE in the New Year's Honours List. Congratulations. And thank also, you very much. Not at all, and thoroughly deserved. And also, you've um, put on your mammoth annual ABO conference. This year it was in Glasgow. I gather now it's Europe's largest orchestral gathering with attendees from, from around the world. And well, it's quite extraordinary, that success. So as a good place to start, I hope you agree, it'll be mm. quick to know about what is the ABO and okay. what do you and your team do? Yeah, well, the ABO is the representative body for professional orchestras, youth ensembles, and the wider classic music industry. Uh, I mean, like the core of it are its full members of all the uh, 70 professional orchestras spread across the UK coming in all shapes and sizes, the well-known large symphony orchestras, the orchestras of the opera and ballet companies, the BBC orchestras and chamber orchestras, peer instrument ensembles, contemporary music groups. But at the core of them, they are, they are professional orchestras. The, you know, the, the musicians are paid either on salary or as freelancers. Um, and um, uh, we've been around since 1948, so over 70 years old, we started as an organization whose primary purpose was to negotiate with the musicians union, to negotiate paying conditions for, for musicians. But within a few years, its role expanded and it's much more now an advocacy body. And in fact, what we do is three things. We call them championing, connecting and developing. So the championing is all the advocacy work we do. Um, we'll go into some more detail about that later and exactly where we are now, but I see that as what I call the macro and the micro. The macro is articulating the public value of orchestras and their place in society. And the micro is uh, liaising with government on specific tax and regulatory issues. Um, and prior to Brexit, we obviously also needed to have input into the European Union. And, and how it developed regulations, which we do through a European Federation of Performing Arts Employers Associations from all across Europe. So that's what we are. We are a trade association for the UK's orchestras. I mean, that's a massive remit from what you were just describing, and there's yeah. a huge amount you're responsible for. I'm yeah. Because sure that, just to expand that, as well as the champion, the connecting is the annual conference, but we do lots and lots of other events for members. So we have these specialist manager groups, so finance, fundraising, education, marketing, digital communications, constant orchestra management, and chief executives themselves, and education management. These groups we bring together on a regular basis so that they share. Um, and you know, and a, a problem shared is a problem solved. And then we have a developing strand of courses, but also something we've developed over the last few years is a focus on leadership. It's a tough job running an orchestra and it's been tough, even tougher these past two years. So we've been looking at both how we help build resilience among the people who are running our orchestras now, but also nurture the next generation. So there are people ready to step up into those leadership roles when they become vacant. And that's our, we're very proud of our Find Your Way program. Um, which... I've been very fortunate to be a recipient of that, and it's fantastic with Richard Wigley and um, Andy Beaumont, Fiona Harvey, did a fantastic job organising that. And it was... Exactly. And yeah. I think you, you, you picked up on a band when you were talking about the conference and the connecting aspects yeah. of your work, both that and within the Find Your Way and developing. There is very much a collegiate atmosphere amongst the members of ABO and knowledge sharing. And... A lot of people assume that orchestras is a competitive. <laughs> and of course, you know, but but actually, you know, no, I, I'm really impressed with how collegiate they are, that they get that they it's it's best to work as a collective um, and solve and and solve problems and make progress together than it is to try to, to, to fix things alone. I think I would, I would certainly from my perspective, working in international touring, it is, as you say, from the outside, it probably looks like people are competitors, and, and they are, the orchestras are competing for the same type of festivals and venues, etc. But actually, as you say, within that, I know that tour managers and us as well speak to other orchestras that have been to certain territories and get their advice, and, and there is 
yeah, very good atmosphere and knowledge sharing in, in that respect. But just going back to championing and public value, um, in the sort of 15 years you've been with the ABO, have you seen a change in the perception of orchestras and the public value at all? Yes. Um, I think when I arrived, there was still an understanding that orchestras alongside opera and ballet was very much a primary component of the arts funding system. Um, the foundation of the Arts Council of Great Britain in 1947 um, was to ensure that the permanent market failure that is endemic to these sorts of organizations mm -hmm. would be supported through public funding. What I mean by endemic market failure um, is that the most important person of relevance to classical music is somebody most people have never heard of. And this is a man called William Balmore. And he was an, an American economist uh, who wrote a, a very important treatise back in the 1960s in which he invented the term cost disease. And this is the concept that there are certain types of industry that simply cannot operate like a private business and achieve efficiency gains, produce the most goods at the lowest cost and thereby make a profit. Um, so along with, obviously this is how the public sector works, um, he actually used a string quartet as his case study, mm. that a string quartet will always require four musicians and will play works that take as long to perform as they did when first written. You cannot make a string quartet more efficient and say, well, this time we're gonna do that work. Instead of um, 40, 40 minutes, it will be 20 minutes and we'll do it with two musicians. It's just, and of course with an orchestra, you have that whole concept of cost disease writ large. That mean, but, and that means that the business model, which is a slightly laughable name we use, is predicated on the, on the fact that every concert loses money. The sheer expense of putting on a concert, not just on the night itself, but crucially the rehearsals, is cost more than you can charge the customer to attend because ticket pricing is market sensitive. And it's a delicate balance between what you, that how expensive you can make your tickets without deterring the customer from buying them. So must we can make yourself too expensive. Plus of course, we want cheap, cheaper tickets available in order to widen access. So, um, You've, you're then stuck with cost disease, the endemic structural deficit that goes into the business of putting on concerts. Well, how do you plug that gap through fundraising and through public subsidy? So now back to the public subsidy. So what I've seen over the 50 years is that from the position where, right, well, clearly an arts council funds orchestras, opera and ballet companies, to a position now where questions are being asked as to whether they should remain publicly funded at all, whether their value um, is sufficient uh, in terms of two primary challenges of relevance and inclusivity. Uh, so I think that th this issue of relevance has become uh, hugely challenging. The other thing we have, that, uh, that we've been dealing with, is, and, these, and we're talking here really about global challenges for orchestras. Not this is not just unique to the UK. Uh, is the sort of media and political perception that classical music is dead. Or if it's not dead, it's dying. And actually we can be our own worst enemy. It's the number of times people in our business say, oh, nobody goes to concerts anymore. Well, of course they do. And one primary tool that the ABO does every three years is, is a statistical survey of its members. And so it's quite crucial to say where we were. The last time we did that in 2019, um, it, it, showed us some very big numbers in relation to our, our social and economic value. So the first big number is that we played over 4 million people in over 3,600 concerts across the UK. And that was but, in three years, was it? No, that was in 2019. In 2019 itself. So this is 2019. We published it in January 2020, mm -hmm. when there was this thing called COVID happening over the nation. <laughs> Oh, that, that, won't, that won't bother us. So there we were proudly announcing our latest set of statistics. Now, crucially, that audience figure had grown from when we started the survey in 2013. Mm -hmm. 
So we've actually had seen up to that point, the 18-19 the season showed, we, we had grown our audience in six years. Alongside that, we were touring to 40 countries across the world. We had a workforce of over 2,000 musicians and 2,000 admin staff and technical crew. And we, we were creating 12,000 engagements for um, freelance musicians. And we were reaching over 700,000 uh, people in through our education and community activity. So that, that adds to our public values. An orchestra is not just an entity that puts on concerts, but also is provides um, uh, has capacity for music education and working in the community. And that now is an intrinsic part of what it means to be an orchestra today. Um, we must be uh, pr providing a broader service to uh, the people we serve than just there to put concerts on the platform. Um, so that's the context really. So there we were. So yes, I'd seen that there, these questions were being asked about the relevance of the orchestra, our role of then gathering the, the data, the statistics that proved that actually we're a vibrant um, art form, growing our audience, being an ambassador for the UK by taking the best of British music making abroad um, and being and having and, and, and through touring, creating inward investment. So we were generating 12% um, of earned income through touring, which is money that, that we're bringing back into the UK. And that earnings thing is also quite important to understand because where British orchestras are different in comparison to our European competitors is we get significantly less public money. Yeah. So it's, the ratio is 50% earned, 20% fundraised, 30% public. Um, and in Scandinavia, that's yeah, probably 80%. 80, 20, 80, yeah. Eight, yeah, there's no, there's, yeah, 80% comes from government support a, 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 across the continent mm. and most of Asia too. The mixed economy model that we have is shared with uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and some other uh, territories, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, very much, no, I think Singapore is quite state, state funded, but it's, it's, there are, the mixed economy model exists in some of those, the, the former Anglo sphere. And then of course you've got the USA, which does it through private support, which is fueled by um, the culture of giving and uh, the incentive of tax breaks. So, so, you know, the, so you either have a statist continental model, a predominantly private model, or the three-legged stool of a mixed economy that we have in the UK. The problem is that the public funding leg of the stool is being soared ever shorter. And all that does is increase your structural deficit because a concert costs what a concert costs. So yeah, so big questions about, about that. Then of course, right, and then that brings us to what happened two years ago. There we are, peak of our success, growing audiences, touring, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly what slams in is a global pandemic. Yes, I mean, there's an extraordinary amount to unpack there. Um, I mean, could, could you also argue, talking about that funding model, we should be celebrating the UK's entrepreneurial spirit and the way that it can have that mixed economy model, it can have, on a commercial capacity to a certain extent to get sales. I know there's that cost disease as you, as you refer to it, um, but also the philanthropic giving tendency in the UK, which is obviously not strong in, in the US, and there is a, a, you know, a proportion of government support. That's something to be, yeah. to be I think I think I think the advantage is it makes us attentive to our audience. Um, we have to be. They, you know, we're dependent on their giving and buying. Mm -hmm. uh, their giving and their purchase power. Um, would you say? But, well, of course, I think you know. But I think it's fair to say we would we would very much appreciate some more public funding. Having said that, one of the ABO's triumphs of a few years back was um, successfully arguing to the Treasury over, to get them to implement orchestra tax relief, yeah. which is a different form of government money. 
which is a tax credit on your production costs, which is basically rehearsal costs. So the, and that now means that we, we finally got a funding mechanism for the rehearsals, whereas ticket income is basically your income stream for the concert itself. But to do every con you know, concert, you've got to have you know, four rehearsals and that a rehearsal is only expenditure, no income. So it's, it's a fantastic extra form um, of government funding. So it's been absolutely vital to keep, uh, to plug the deficit, another, another tool in the toolkit to make sure that we the that, 26, to, that came in in 2016. And after, that was similar to the theatre. Yeah, theatre, yeah. it started with theatre tax relief and what we did was we said, it was film, TV, games, theatre. And we mm. successfully argued that by logical, by logic said you had to extend it to orchestras because an orchestra was already a qualifying cost for, if you booked yeah. an orchestra to do your, your soundtrack for your movie or TV drama series, you could, you get a tax credit on that cost of that orchestra. Uh, or for do the, a game soundtrack. Once we got into theatre, that's where it got interesting, because then, of course, it includes opera and ballet. Therefore, automatically, the orchestra, as a co cost in an opera and ballet, qualified for tax relief. So I said, well, come on, you've, you've now left hanging what an orchestra's bread and butter is, what it actually is set up to do, which is to put on concerts. You've got to extend it to concerts. And very quickly, all credit to George Osborne, Johnson at the time, who went, yeah. you're bang on. Totally logical, we'll do it. And we and it came through quite quickly. Am I understanding the definition of an orchestra though is, has been also evolved in that time? How they define what an orchestra is or is Oh yeah, because there is no there is no definition. I've never found an actual <laughs> formal definition. So what we did was we set a kind of like we said minimum 12. Um because uh, originally they tried to say and it had to have all four instrument groups. Yeah. We said, well, yeah. well, no, because an orchestra could be can be all strings only, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so we just we had to explain to them. Oh, the, the best bit was where I actually talked to one of the junior civil servants at the outset of this, um, who said, well, we, we, we've been told to follow up this thing around orchestra tax relief, but we don't quite get it because we understand with theatre it has to do lots, it has to do rehearsals. But of course, that's not the case with, with you, is it? I went, what? Really? And I suddenly realised he thought that to do a concert, the musicians literally just turned up and played the music on the scores in front of them. That was the that was, do in the UK. <laughs> that was the level of ignorance that I was dealing with. But, but yes, you are right. We do what we do have to work off of fewer rehearsals than may happen in many other countries. I also think, funny enough, and this is a controversial viewpoint, that that can give concerts a rather good, risky edge that can be quite exciting. If it's between the very cusp of triumph and disaster, <laughs> it, you know, it stirs the spirits. Wasn't it Bernstein who said you need a, for a great plan, you need a great idea and not enough time, I think is uh, yeah. probably yeah. That sounds similar. Yeah. But exactly. just to finish on this point then, I think there is a lot of, uh, and to a certain extent quite rightly, um, criticism about the amount of state support. And actually from what you're saying, from the public value, from the audience and the public, it's pre-COVID and we'll get the, presumably the results in the next data coming up soon with the orchestras. From the audience perspective, we're engaging more people than ever and that's very exciting. From, but from for whatever reason, with the state, that's there's fewer statutory funding, less statutory funding available. But what you could also argue, they've brought in the tax relief. Um, UK auctions might be less vulnerable because they've got that mixed economy. And the cultural recovery funding was not to be sniffed at. I mean, yeah. I know it was across the whole of the arts, and that's everything from mm. orchestras to comedy clubs. Mm. But that was nearly two billion pounds, and that's a significant amount of money. Oh yeah, yeah. And so basically. As I said, you know, COVID slammed in in March 2020, mm. and our dependence on earned income is what made British orchestras so much more vulnerable than our colleagues in other parts of the world. Because um, as soon as the doors were closed, and you literally couldn't put concerts on, then your ticket income, half your income, has evaporated. Unlike 20% uh, in, for a contest of your orchestra. When I was talking with colleagues in other performing arts associations in Europe, um, it, they were talking about the impact of um, their national lockdown as if it was an inconvenience. Mm. And that it was simply, it, you know, it was just the tragedy was that the audience could no longer hear the wonderful art. But for us, it was existential. And I genuinely thought, I mean, before June 2020, that period between March and June, 
I seriously thought we were witnessing the death of our sector. That this, there was no, no way of surviving this. But the government did do some crucial interventions. Along there with, of course, the general um, implementation of the job retention scheme so that staff could be furloughed um, uh, and the culture recovery fund of, of actually providing emergency funding. Because what was happening in that period of no concerts was orchestras were simply depleting their reserves. Because even if you furloughed staff, you still had costs. You know, your office costs weren't evaporating. Uh, you had to keep some staff on, the pay on payroll to keep things going. Um, you know, you could not shut down in time. Uh, so inevitably, there was a steady deterioration in your, in your financial viability. So, yeah, the Cultural Recovery Fund, the emergency grants that that provided, absolutely essential. And many of our members, thankfully, were beneficiaries. And I think the useful thing about the Cultural Recovery Fund was it, it, it was a wake-up call to government as to why organisations like Oxford need public funding. That they could understand, ah, oh, I see, yes, without public funding, you can't exist. It was so, in that respect, maybe it helped. So, yeah, so the Cultural Recovery Fund made a difference. And now the most recent um, uh, development has been a temporary uplift in orchestra tax relief so that you can claim at a higher rate than before. But it's just for the, this financial, coming financial year. It's going well from 27th of October, it's gone from 25% to 50%. On your qualifying costs um, but then it tapers off and is back down to 25 percent by 24 25 so uh, we would like that to be extended because that was brought in pre-omicron so when they announced that we didn't know we had omicron around the corner mm. and of course omicron uh led to a very very difficult december and january um, and actually at the moment we're in a situation where the, the government, bizarrely, is telling us that their work is done. COVID is over. They are withdrawing our regular meetings. They're stopping having these meetings as far as they can, and they're dismantling the department that's really focusing on, that's been focusing on COVID. And we're saying, no, COVID is not over. I mean, there's 100,000 positive cases a day. And, and guess what? Musicians are testing positive. And if they're testing positive, we cannot let them into the workplace and you've got to replace them. And so it's still pretty chaotic out there with people testing positive and then having to find, you know, I've, I've been hearing some really scary stories of just the challenge of having to find, constantly find the words to replace them. So the thing that's happened over these two years is it has drained the resilience of many of the people who work you know, to keep their orchestra going and, and, and the constant planning and, you plan, you undo, you plan again, you have to undo that. The sheer volume of cancellations, postponements, um, uh, it's taken its toll. Uh, so, and that's why we feel that it's important that we provide some, we start to really focus on resilience. This has to be now be something that we really look at is how do we look after the people who've been through these very, very challenging time. Well, I think the role that the AWO play in, well, firstly, lobbying and secondly, in, in the well-being of the orchestra manager and the players that are you know, on the front line is, is certainly invaluable. Yeah. Just the other thing is, the reason, and the other thing point about COVID, of course, where it's not, it, we're certainly not done with it yet, is its impact on touring. Yeah. Because, you know, Asia is still not open. Mm. So... Um, <laughs> watch this space <laughs> okay but you know no, you're I, right i mean china won't open up for another till 2024 possibly yeah. who knows but um yeah and we'll we just, just and we happen to lot. I mean, although it's a very small marketplace we have clearly now lost russia as a um a a potential touring location true true um well just to i'd like to come back to touring particularly in the context of sustainability but just to move on from all things covid you mentioned very briefly about uh, your role in terms of a championing role you used to have input with your colleagues within the EU. And is that, but is that still the case? Do you still have those pan-European discussions and can you still influence? And then secondly, again, you were talking about the context of how, how we talk about classical music, about it 
it being in inverted commas dead, but actually Brexit similarly talked in very negative terms. Is there a more positive spin? I mean, orchestras are still touring, right? And they're still touring across Europe. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, but, yeah, this is something that absolutely make clear because there has been some scaremongering of that. <gasps> Brexit means nobody can go on tour. Of course they can. And, and in fact, um, CBSO are touring Germany and France as we speak. I mean, tours are happening, but Brexit has made them more complicated, without a doubt. So that has also occupied a lot of our time over the last few years, ever since in the run of the referendum, where we made it very clear that we that Brexit was a bad thing, would be a bad thing for orchestras, to post-referendum and our liaison with governments to try to, to make sure they were aware of the, the key issues that were, you know, that we needed them to fix, leading to the UK EU trade cooperation agreement, which is not what we wanted. Um, and removing ourselves from the single market and customs union means that we are now treated as a third country in our relationship with the EU. And then that creates the problems that we're now having to navigate. Uh, that's in three key areas, the movement of people, which is both inbound into the UK and outbound into Europe. Um, if we want to recruit European members of staff now, we need tier two visas or tier five if it's for less than 12 months. We've got permitted paid engagement, which is what a lot of artists can come in on for up to 30 days, um, which is good. But, the, but And most countries in the EU we've been able to establish have got something similar to that, a, an exemption, a short-term exemption for people coming to do performances, but not all of the EU 27. So we're still finding those, there are a few countries that still have bureaucracy or a cost to um, attached to a British artist British and, and ensembles being able to work in their country. So we're still navigating the visa work permit thing. And then you've got the whole movement of goods, which is the musical instruments and everything else that goes that you need to get over for the concerts. Uh, if it's the individual musician carrying their instrument, we established that carnets were not required. And, but they are required if you're loading the instruments up on a truck. And as soon as you're using a truck, then that has to get to Dover, queue up, get its carnet stamped, get over and then move. And then we hit the third problem, which is road haulage limits, which we had no idea. And I, I hadn't even realized there were road haulage limits. So I hadn't talked to government about that because I was unaware that road haulage limits would even have any sort of impact on us. And my God, they have. So the UK EU trade agreement uh, imposes very strict restrictions on using on UK registered trucks doing unloads in the EU to no more than three before the law of the truck must return to the UK. And um, so multi-day tours with orchestra's own truck is now impossible. Right, which is a real pain. And that's still the case. That is absolutely still okay. the case. And just to stress, because there's also a bit of myth making that somehow it's the UK are the big, big bad wolf on this one. And the EU is this lovely, saintly, all fluffy, lovely. No, no. The, e, the trouble is the EU is a protectionist institution and they are protecting their own market. And we have fallen into, and we need the EU to fix this road haulage problem. It's, for, it's not a UK problem. It's, these are conditions imposed by the EU. So we're hoping, and that's where you're back to, are we still in, involved with our colleagues in Europe? Very much. And we're relying on our good friends at Pearl, which is our European Federation, to broker conversation with the European Commission, in particular over this road haulage issue, um, and to see if we can if this could be an area that could be uh, remedied through further negotiations between UK and EU. And it has been fascinating this week to discover Lord Frost, to read Lord Frost admitting that uh, mistakes were made in particular in relation to Tory musicians, that he has fessed up. And that, he's picked that out, wow. Yeah, okay. that, yeah, that, you know, they, they muddled 
immigration with mobility and should mm. never have done so. Mm. So yeah, so there's definitely, there are things to fix and that's what the ABO is here to work on and we, we, we will do the best we can. But on the whole, what, what we do is we help guide our members through the new regulations yeah. and, the, and the obstacles they face and help them. Uh, but yeah, but that does mean touring is still, it's still happening. Um, oh, absolutely. And, and as you say, CBSO out there, London Philharmonic Orchestra, talk to you at Philharmonia, um, you know, lots of others have been out on the roads. And I mean, it's no different in many respects, well, there is our differences, of course, but um, the house of power, we have Japanese ensembles and orchestras coming over touring throughout Europe at the time. And I presume also reciprocally, um, there are there are some restrictions for European orchestras coming to the UK. But again, no, it's actually it's actually really easy. Okay. Uh, we, we actually have a really, you know, we're actually quite good on this. We have a, the permitted paid engagement system is light touch, turn up at the border, just show you've got proof of a gig and you're in. So long as you don't stay over 30 days and no, no orchestral tour is ever going to be over 30 days. So um, we, we will be shortly. Uh, next month, we'll see the what's happening in, in this year's proms. And I'm sure there will be plenty exactly. of visiting orchestras. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so I think you're right. The overriding message is it's not to diminish the challenges, but it can happen. And I think it is the accumulative element um, for orchestral managers of all things COVID, all things Brexit. It's that resilience, as you say, which, yeah. which is great. But, we, but the main thing is we don't want European promoters to think they shouldn't book British orchestras Absolutely. because Brexit will make it difficult. No, no, no. Keep, keep the faith. You know. You're preaching to the choir here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. with all that in mind and the extraordinary amount which has been imposed on people working in the industry in the last couple of years, is there the headspace for some other equally, if not more so, really important topics? And those that immediately come to mind are sustainability and equality, diversity, and inclusion. So just yeah. start with sustainability. I mean, that's very closely linked yeah. to touring. And I know you guys, the ABO put out a green guide in 2010 with Judy's bicycle, and this is a conversation which you're continuing in earnest. But as I say, is there the enthusiasm, maybe that's the wrong word, is there the headspace to be thinking about this? Uh, I, think, I think, to be honest, climate change is the one that I think people are struggling to find that headspace. Why is that? Um, well, I think that they've struggled all along. I mean, we published that guide in 2010, mm. having spent a couple of years working on it with partners like Orchestras Live and the Arts Council, um, and with Julie's Bicycle. And uh, we've, we've revisited it, and Julie's Bicycle say they've looked at it, and they said, look, it's still absolutely valid. What we say in there, and the, the other crucial document that sits alongside it, which is how to measure your emissions, they said it's all absolutely still valid bar there's a there's rather there is a whole section on your on cd packaging that's probably getting increasingly <laughs> redundant but yeah. other than that it's all completely valid and in, and the, and since then we've also seen the scottish class music sustainability guide which was published last year yeah. uh, which sort of builds on that but is actually a really good piece of work really good so it's great yeah. to see our scottish um members um, are now absolutely actively engaged with how they make their get their practice greener. Um, what happened in 2010 was we, we while we were working on um, on this as a priority area, the global financial crash swept in, and it became all about money. Uh, and everybody was just saying, "Look, of course I want to be environmentally sustainable, but I'm afraid it's going at the bottom of the intro because we're literally having to deal now with." cuts in arts council funding, redundancies, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we went through a grim time in that period from 2009, and, and it's, still, it's still in a way there, because on the public funding, the cuts that were implemented in 2010 um, are, are now, we've never, we haven't had any increases since then. So the public funding has flatlined in, in a decade. So, you know, we're still living with the consequences of that of that global downturn. The, however, the, what's what's changing now is that the funding agencies in England, Scotland, and Wales are now saying, "You've got to tell us how you're going to be more more sustainable." And in and in England, certainly, it's one of their um, key investment, investment principles. principles. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's sort of non-negotiable that now if you want public funding, you've got to come up with your plan. Now, nobody's saying 
that, you know, again, orcas can't, you know, we're not, we're not going to stop touring because we're all eager to hear artists and orchestras from around, you know, from different countries. And I, of course, that is going to continue. The, the question is, how do we do, how do we, what can we do in the context that, of course, what an orchestra is designed to do has got, will inevitably create emissions, is plan and mitigate as best we can. Uh, I would argue, of course, that classical music has one advantage, that it is an acoustic art form played on recycled instruments. <laughs> uh, we are, our emissions are as nothing to the rock and pop industry. Uh, so, you know, but of course that doesn't mean that we're, 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 we get off scot-free. Of course we have to do whatever we can. So the tools are there, we've had them for 10 years, um, and we just encourage our members to pick up that green guide again and just look up and just to have a close look at the way you, way you do things and, and, and reduce your emissions accordingly. In any case, we've got to see what's going to happen in terms of the UK government's commitment to a net zero economy. Um, anyway, we will be facing a situation where energy is going to be provided in different ways uh, you know, and we'll have to look at what how we contribute to that drive towards net zero because eventually an orchestra will have to have no doubt you know, will we still have fossil fuel driven trucks don't know you know so we will have to see um i mean some people said to me why do we have an Asian orchestra comes to Europe, and a European orchestra goes to the USA, and an American orchestra goes comes to Europe. I mean, but that's the way our business works. It's a global art form, and I think we don't, and it doesn't sit comfortably with me to somehow be be so nationalistic that we should only ever hear British orchestras in Britain. Well, and an extension to that, I've had promoters say to me, "Why would I book a?" just to use Japan as an example, a Japanese orchestra playing Beethoven. But that again is a very nationalistic approach. And I think you're right, the, the approach of avoid, reduce, offset is, is often quoted. Avoiding is not something as an industry we want to do because we believe in the power of international cultural exchange. Reducing though and offsetting is certainly possible and the measures to put in place to do that. Mm. But do you think, as an industry, not only in the UK, but more broadly, we're actually addicted to touring. We just can't stop. Listen, you could put aside the financial elements, which for many orchestras worldwide, actually, they need to support that uh, financially. It's not always not generally on a commercial model, although the UK, for some orchestras, is an exception. Um, actually, there's an addiction. I mean, and maybe we need to also redefine success because performing in Carnegie Hall or Vienna Concert House is an indicative of an orchestra's success in the UK. But actually, there are many other measures of success. And do you agree with that statement? You could say that. <laughs> I, can't, I couldn't possibly comment. Um, I think I don't think it's a question of being addicted to it. I just think it's it is part and parcel of what it means to be an orchestra as part of a global family. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm being very I, indiscreet. I also work in international touring, so I'm not yeah, one to, <laughs> to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is dangerous territory for going down. But, it's um, yeah. absolutely fine. We like dangerous yeah. territory. It's yeah. all good. Um, yeah. But so, again, I'm going back to your lobbying role, because I often feel that within the, the context of this debate, government can do more to enable change, to enable people to make the more sustainable and the all quote-unquote right decision. So, for example, the budget before last, the Chancellor in the UK reduced, sorry, yeah, reduced tax on domestic flights. In context, trains are extremely expensive in the UK. The infrastructure, particularly in the north of England, is, is terrible. But actually, if they allowed a better infrastructure, a better service, and at a more economical price, people would make the more simple choice. Oh, yeah, we, and, we, we absolutely uh, want to find a way in which musicians could travel to concerts. At least right here, we're talking about within the UK. We'd love them to yeah. be able to travel by train. There's one fundamental problem. I mean, I've just been looking at whether I could go to a, a concert in a city outside London, and the last train back is at 9.30. Yeah, yeah. And this is something we hear consistently. The trains simply stop 
before the concert. You know, there are no trains back after the concert. So inevitably, everybody has to drive because public transport is not available. So automatically, we're stymied in our ambitions to offer greener travel to the musicians, because we think musicians would probably find it a nicer experience for themselves anywhere. But mm. we can't, because the trains don't run late enough to get back, get them back home. That's also for so, audiences as well, of course. Yeah, but audiences will tend to be local, whereas in many respects, the orchestra, the musicians are, will have had to come from somewhere to get to, yeah. I mean, obviously within London, it's different, you know. Yeah. You have tra public transport readily available. But as soon as you're outside London, public transport becomes is a different animal. Yes, and but then, so I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here. You're absolutely right. In many cities, um, and, I, and I do kind of avoid this as well because the last bus finishes perhaps at nine thirty or whatever it might be. Um, you you will find yeah that the, the transport only goes up to a certain time. But actually, could orchestras also be more flexible and schedule their concerts earlier to enable people to get to get back? I mean, there seems to also be a certain rigid element and a stigma associated to classical music with that, with this sort of rigid structure of seven thirty concert, have to have an interval, have to have a concerto, symphony, etc. Actually, if they're more flexible in their presentation. Could be, also, but also attract a broader audience, which is another yeah, the next. Element could be, but there are multiple reasons why you know we still stick to the seven thirty start time. People want their tea before the concert, so you know it's. Um, we always end up, we you know we guess. I mean, in fact, the pandemic was quite interesting because people were experimenting with shorter concert lengths and different times, and mm. some found it quite actually really quite effective. But we we do seem to be we have we have gone back to the traditional model seven thirty to nine thirty. Um, and audiences seem to be happy that they are back to those start times and concert lengths. So um, it's, uh, I think that we have that format and timing for a reason, and because it, on the whole, it does work. Yes, I think also pre-COVID, um, I think they're still doing the standard London Symphony Orchestra had their half six fix short yeah. concerts, which are covered very successful. Mm -hmm also in broadening their audience base as well. Um, and, but, and so as a segue to that, we've touched on briefly EDI. Yeah, well, this is, this is, this is something that actually is definitely um, the topic of now. And, and actually has been for a long time. Uh, and interestingly enough, the ABO did a seminar on diversity in 2003. So we'd woken up to this as a problem 20 years ago. Um, and reading the report from that, because it's before my time, um, there, it's clear that you know, there's that reference to it, this is, it, it will take a generation to change this. Well, 20 years is a generation and not much has changed. So we're at the point now where this has, to, something has to happen because this is where the, that public value, remember I talked about how it was um, seen as intrinsic to the public funding system that you know, an arts council would fund orchestras, opera and ballet companies. This is what is now, this is what we are now seeing changing. Arts Council in England have made it very, very clear in their let's create strategy for the next 10 years that there are no, that, you know, that there are no sacred cows. Um, they have set a very clear set of principles that need to be adhered to if you are to receive public funding. So we talked about how environmental sustainability is one of them, but the other is that they expect their funded organisations to be fully inclusive. What does that mean? Well, yeah, inclusive, it all actually starts with inclusion. So inclusion is where you make sure that there's absolutely nothing in the way you work that is exclusive. Are you genuinely welcoming of everybody, and particularly every, uh, people who, um, who would fall under those nine protected characteristics enshrined in the Equality Act of 2010? So, um, and the three obviously big areas for us tend to be race, sex, and disability. These are three prime, real three priority areas. 
uh, where we have not covered ourselves in glory for the years. Now, we are not alone in this. And the USA is ahead of us, uh, very much so, particularly in terms of um, and analyzing, trying to understand why they are not as diverse as American society is itself. And, you know, you have an orchestra in a city like Baltimore or Detroit that does not reflect in the residents of that city. And we have the same here. Just so we have- Are you talking about staff or administration or players or both? I'm talking about every, everything, okay. everything. So, you know, we are talking here about, uh, well, the, the prim primary focus is the musicians. The music, you know, because obviously that's what the public sees. That, that, that's our shop window. And the public sees a lot of white people. Um, and if you and there is this line that if you can't see it, you can't be it. And unless we have a more diverse roster of musicians on the platform, uh, we are will we we are own, you know, we will not make progress. But the, the problem is, how do you then get there? Particularly when, if you are a member of an orchestra, you effectively have uh, residency rights. You know you, that is, you you are a member of that orchestra or you're a salaried employee. Um, a a theatre has some advantages. If, if, if I'm putting on a production, I cast to that production. I can change my cast every time I'm putting on a, putting on a new play. But an orchestra is that body of people who've been through a rigorous recruitment process to win a seat in the orchestra and can stay in that seat for 40 years. So it's a very hard engine to change. But change has to come because, as I say, the Arts Council is now saying you must prove, provide evidence of your inclusivity. So we do have to ask questions now how we recruit, which artists we're booking, what repertoire we're playing, and of course, who also we are reaching through our education and community work and, and ensure that every aspect of that is inclusive. Then, of course, you also have the same question to ask about your administrative staff and your governance, your, your, your trustees. Now, interestingly enough, you see your admin staff and governance is actually easier to change than your musicians because there's churn in staff mm. and, and fixed term limits on boards. So uh, you are a better placed, perhaps, to affect real change when it comes you know, because the musicians is, is a very hard one because of course we're dependent on a talent pipeline. So, you know, we employ musicians who have been through our conservatoires and those conservatoires have relied on a music education system that has in itself been inclusive and widened access. So, but of course we, we keep blaming the next link in the chain. We'll say, oh, it's the fault of the conservatoires and then the conservatoires is the fault of music education. Basically, we're going to get over this blame game. We have to all work together to say what are the most effective mechanisms for widening access throughout that talent pipeline. Um, now, in terms of the government has now added another component to this whole issue of inclusivity. Uh, our Secretary of State, Nadine Doris, has written to every funded organization in England saying that they are also now expected to make progress on resolving socioeconomic. Um, bar barriers that we are not we have not been providing enough opportunities for people from working class backgrounds and we will now be measured on the on on the number of people employed from say, from those backgrounds um, and will cease to be recipients of public funding if we do not make progress so it's getting quite you know so suddenly this is all sounding rather threatening but um but since we've been saying for 20 years, well, we clearly have a, we have got a diversity problem. We've now got to do something about it, which brings us to the next bit, the E word, the equity word, because I maintain that it, it's always written as E-D-I, but actually it's, it's I-E-D is the critical. First, are we inclusive, genuinely inclusive? Are there, is there anything we're doing that is, that is actually smacks of exclusion rather than inclusion? If there is, once we have isolated what that problem is, that's when equity comes in. And equity is where you do a specific intervention. So it might be you say, right, therefore next season, we will guarantee that a proportion of the works that we perform will be by composers of color. Or, every, or we literally will say, 
we, we will expect there to, to, will set a percentage of our orchestra we expect in 10 years time to have employed people from different backgrounds to those who we have traditionally offered jobs to. Um, it's where you actually have to set yourself some targets and, and fulfill them. And th at the end of that process, you should be diverse. So it sounds in many ways that it's um, encouraging that there are these stipulations that these targets need to be fulfilled from, let's call it IDE then, um, and IED, IED, thank you, and social economic uh, standpoints. Um, but are the resources and expertise being provided by the, for example, the Arts Council and from the Department of Culture and Media Sport in order to support these organisations to actually deliver on these well, ambitious Art, targets? Arts Council has published a report on a fair and inclusive classical music sector. Um, and that has analysed the problem and it has made some recommendations. So it's a really useful piece of work and we're grateful for them for convening a working group of which I was part to help put that, um, uh, inform the delivery of that report. And we're now working with them on what we now do to move to move that forward. So I think all credit to them. DCMS, no, DCMS are not giving any guidance. They're just saying, this is what we expect. But but they would, as always, oh, it would then be handed over to Arts as England as the you know, technical development agency for Arts in England to, to then um, guide its funded clients which they are doing, um, yeah. And I suppose um, there are a lot of the things we've discussed. There's, again, being about sustainability, but also in this context, this discussion as well, when there's an emphasis from government to say, you need to be doing more from a social economic point of view. Absolutely, that's should be the case, but, but there's resources, also financial resources support that. Also, you could offer tickets, for example, but then actually there's, a, there's an actual cost to that. And yeah, the cost of, yeah. Things, of course, yeah. Well, yeah, but, but some things, won't necessarily cost. I mean, it, it won't cost necessarily any more to adapt your recruitment practice. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, it might, but it might cost something to do some specific, you know, equity interventions. Um, uh, but uh, it, but it, it's just about coming up with a plan. What is costing is it does involve an awful lot of form filling. There's there's now annual monitoring, which is very time consuming, um, but it has to be done. So, you know, and that's in, to enable us to all set a benchmark in order to know, we can't make progress until we know exactly how things stand now. Yeah. Um, forgive me just doing two quick plugs on, in this context of this conversation. One is um, Music Matters I'm In programme, which has a power of been doing a lot of other organisations, which is a fantastic audit, if you like, of your diversity and inclusion policies. Um, and also we've just recorded a disability and access podcast, uh, including with the NABIO member, Dougie Scar, CEO of the Bournemouth City Orchestra. Um, so definitely check that out. We've revised lots of other insightful um, uh, ideas about how you can enact meaningful change. So as we come towards the end, Mark, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, for giving us a snapshot of what, what the British orchestral scene looks like now. Um, I always love to finish on a positive note. So what are you excited about most for the sector going forward? Well, not so much going forward. I think I've, what's really inspired is actually how enterprising and ingenious our members have been through the pandemic. Yes, it was difficult, it was tough, and obviously the emergency grants were necessary, but they really did think, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. How do we keep our orchestra communicating to its public? And I think what's been really interesting is that shift to digital, the, um, the acceleration in understanding the power of digital and what works, um, uh, particularly actually in reaching into schools and care homes um, and sort of through our education being to work. So I think they, you know, the fact that they've, they've, they've proved their resilience, they've been ingenious, and there are some real benefits, funny enough, there are some COVID dividends that we can now take forward. That have arisen from simply saying, you know, we're not giving up. We're, you know, what what can we do? Uh, and to some extent, they've actually en ended up reaching more people than they did before. Um, so I think that, and the, and here we are back, and the music's as good as ever.
Um, and um, it's just brilliant to now be going back into the concert hall and, and thinking, yes, it's in 3D, it's live, yeah. and it sounds great. Here, yeah, yeah. that sort of visceral energy, you can't, you can't, you know, we did definitely miss that. Well, what a great note to finish on. Many thanks again for joining us, Mark, and to you and your team at the ABO for all you do to represent the interests of the UK professional orchestra scene and, and the wider classical music industry. Before we leave you, we would also like to thank Harrison Parrott's marketing team, Fiona Livingston and Harley Getch, and our sound editor, Merlin Thomas. Our theme music is composed by Robert Cochran. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out all the other episodes from The Culture Bar with topics including race and the civic responsibility of the arts, or how the arts can respond to the climate emergency, and more recently, as I mentioned earlier, disability and access in the arts. Alternatively, if you want something light to touch, we have a speed pod series with contributors from the likes of Poland, Switzerland, Wales, and Iceland. You can trawl through the archive with interviews with MPs, lords, university professors, and even football referees. To get all that and more, please subscribe. See you soon. Thank you.